All right, guys, good morning. I went ahead and started the recording, so I think we should be good to go with things. Um, but we thank you guys so much for coming this morning. Mr. Verulich and I always joke that in these junior breakfasts that we get to talk about the most exciting topic. Um, not so much, but we try to make it exciting. But anyway, we're going to be talking today about the SAT and the ACT. And we know, I mean, the SAT and the ACT are always something that our students are really concerned about. But I think this year with coronavirus and all the changes that we've experienced over the past year, things have changed even more. Um, so we'll touch on that a little bit. Um, so I guess we'll get started. Um, Mr. Verlich, well, let me see how this will work here. There we go. Okay, that's you, Mr. Verlich. Okay, and to just talk a little bit about the SAT and ACT, um, they're standardized tests and you know, it's, it's part of what's used to measure students' future success in college. Um, you know, before COVID, I think it was a, you know, a huge part of what, what they looked at. These days, I'm not quite so sure. Um, you know, it, it's a piece of the puzzle, but, um, and I know we'll talk about it a little bit more, but a lot of the, the schools have made it um, optional. But it, it, they use the SAT as part of, and ACT as part of what they look at with the student's portfolio, along with their transcript, which is something we send to the school that has all their grades on it, um, their application essay. And I know in talking to some of the, the college recruiters that come through here, they view that essay um, with a lot of weight. So just keep that in mind with your kids. Um, also their activities, their recommendation letters, et cetera. Um, and then as far as CSM, I know these days too, CSM has become more and more popular, um, especially with students, you know, doing their, their college work online. Um, so if your student is going to CSM, they don't necessarily need to take the SAT um, or ACT, but they can, um, you know, because they need to, you know, CSM generally gives a placement test and they can use their SAT and ACT scores in lieu of the placement test. And the scores are here. You could see math is 530 uh, on the SAT. English is 480. So roughly ar around a thousand SAT would you know would be acceptable for for CSM. And then on the ACT, it's 21 for English and math. So the next thing we'll go over is a little bit about each of the tests and what they entail and what they're like. So the first thing, and I think the more common, really the one that most people are more familiar with is the SAT. So the SAT has three sections, reading, writing, and math. And when your student signs up, they'll see that the writing option or the writing section is optional and they'll get very excited because our students don't like to write necessarily, um, but we still recommend that they take the writing part of the SAT because most colleges, if they're requiring the SAT, they like to see the writing score. Um, and you can't go back and just take the SAT, the writing portion. So it's better for our students just to get everything done in one shot. So we do recommend that they take the writing portion. Um, and when they get a score back for the SAT, they'll get a score out of 1600, that's the scale. And writing is graded um, or scored separately from the 1600. So the 1600 includes 800 points for the writing, or sorry, 800 points for the reading section and 800 points for the math section. So that's the maximum score they can get. And a lot of times I think the most common question that we get from parents and students is, well, is, what's a good score? How do I know if my score is good? And to be honest, there's no straight up answer to that. I mean, obviously the closer you are to 800, the better it is but your score's only as good as it gets you, if it gets you where you want to go. So for example, if your student's goal is to get into Harvard, a score of 650 on, or actually I guess like 1300, I'll say, um, may not be good. But if your student wants to go to University of Maryland, a score of 1300 is probably good. So it's important to really think about the school they wanna go to and what that school or college typically requires um, for a student who's looking to be admitted to that place. So you can find that information about what scores are typically required on the College Board website. And if you log on there and in the search bar, if you just, and I can show you guys in a couple of minutes when we're done. Um, but if you log on there and you search for a school, it'll bring up like a profile page. And then you can see the information about what typical SAT score that they'll require. 
Also, CapEx is another website where students can search for colleges and see kind of some information about what a typically accepted freshman looks like. And the last thing is, is just talking to the individual college. You can call their admissions office, you can email them, and a lot of colleges have that information posted on their actual website. Um, so some prep opportunities on how students can prepare for the SAT. Uh, there's a website called Khan Academy, and a lot of students use this in their math class. Um, but Khan Academy provides free SAT prep online. Um, so this is a cool opportunity for students because they can take like a practice test. And then with the practice test, it'll kind of be able to tell them where they need extra support and extra practice. And then it will give them practice based on the results of that. I'm a big fan of Khan Academy because it's free. I like that part. And it's kind of easy for students if they spend like an hour to a week on it. It doesn't feel that bad because they can do it in their um, at their convenience. Like they don't have to go anywhere. It's, it's not like a big deal. So a lot of students like Khan Academy. Another thing is PSAT scores. Um, and I know that um, some students had the opportunity to take the PSAT this year. So if your student did, you can link their scores, log online to their college board and link that. And that will link to Khan Academy as well and give, the, give them um, really personalized practice that will kind of give them the opportunity to really increase their skills in particular areas that the, the PSAT felt that they needed more practice in. Um, something else is the answer SAT prep course. And we'll talk about this in a little bit, but the answer class is typically like a Saturday class, but this year they're hosting it virtually because of the pandemic. And this will give students the opportunity to do some prep as well, like in the class format. And CSM also offer, offers a prep course. I'm not sure if they're offering it now because of the pandemic, but generally from time to time, they will offer an SAT prep course at CSM as well. And typically this is like a Saturday format too, where they go in for a day or two like a Saturday or two and go over just some information. But the only thing about the answer class and the CSM prep course, it's not really personalized. So if your student goes to that, they may spend a lot of time going over, I don't know, for example, algebra one coursework where your student may be totally, you know, competent in that area and may not need that extra practice. So those courses aren't gonna necessarily be as personalized as using their PSAT scores or logging onto Khan Academy. So just something to, to keep in mind. And I just want to take a couple of minutes and talk about the SAT subject tests. And for most people, this is probably not going to be something that applies to you. But I, I want to mention it probably more for the fact that when you have your students sign up for the SAT, they probably, you know, you don't want to let them sign up for a subject test unless you know specifically a college requires it. There's a, you know, they want to sign up for the test of general knowledge, which is going to have your English and your math section. Um, you know, some colleges after that are going to require, in addition to the general knowledge test, are going to require um, a subject test, specifically their high level colleges. Um, also, if a student is applying to a certain kind of program, um, maybe like an engineering program, a, you know, a, a chemical engineering, a physics. I know students that might, you know, that I've had to take the uh, subject test. A, a student was going to Brown one year, a student going to the Air Force Academy. Those were the kind of schools that required a certain subject test in, in specific things, MIT, places like that. So when your student is signing up, have them sign up for the general test, not a subject test, unless you, you know specifically the college is requiring it. Um, am I missing anything here, Ms. Pawnee? I think that's it. That was more like a, a warning not to sign up for it, I think, so. Yeah, pretty much. And that's not really common. I mean, I think Mr. Verlich has been a counselor just a little bit longer than me, but I've had very few students actually do the SAT subject test. So just so you know if that's something you see, um, but typically the, a typical student won't be taking that. Right. I, I, I can't tell you the last time I've had someone take it. I, I can't remember. It's not remember. very common. No. So the next thing we want to go over is the ACT and what the ACT looks like. Um, and it used to be I know when I was in high school, everyone talked about the ACT was like the West Coast test that schools on the West Coast used to accept. And that's really not the case anymore. Um, most colleges accept both the SAT and the ACT. Um, but the ACT consists of four sections, English, reading, math, and science. And writing is also optional on the ACT. So the ACT is kind of unique because it has that science portion. 
So we typically, when we're working with students, if a student has a really strong science background, maybe they're in biomed, or maybe they've just always been a really good science student, we encourage them to really look into the ACT um, because it could showcase them as a, you know, in a, in a better light and get them a better score, which may either get them into their school or may get them more scholarship money. So that's something to keep in mind. Um, the score range on the ACT is from one to 36. So um, if your student comes home and says, hey, I got a 27 on the ACT, don't be panicked. It's just one to 36 is the scale score. Um, and what they'll do is they'll give a student a score for each individual section, but the composite score is the combination of all of the sections, and that's the score that colleges are really looking at. So that's the one to 36 scale. And writing, again, is kind of um, graded or scored separately from the main four sections of English, reading, math, and science. Um, and again, students will always say, what's a good score? And I'm going to give the same advice for the ACT as I did for the SAT. Um, the biggest thing is that the score has to be good enough to get you into where you want to go. So College Board, now College Board is the organization that um, does the SAT. So if you look on their website, they have some information about the ACT, but not as much just because it's a separate product than what, what they're selling essentially. But they do have information on their website. Um, CapEx, again, is a great website. You can look on there to find out some information. But I think the biggest thing is to just reach out to each college and ask them what a typically accepted freshman looks like in terms of ACT scores. That will give you the best insight, I think. And ju just touching on the differences, and I think we've sort of covered them already in some of our discussion, but I just want to go back and highlight them. Main differences, subjects covered. I know Ms. Pawnee just talked about science being on the ACT and, and that's not on the SAT. Um, the scoring one to 36 versus one, you know, 1600 being the top for the SAT. And then the material, you know, I guess going with the science, you know, it's gonna benefit kids. I think the ACT kids who have taken more higher higher level classes are gonna benefit on the ACT versus the SAT. Um, you know, I've always heard with the SAT, um, you know, pretty much everything on there math wise is algebra one, algebra two and geometry. You know, so at that point, if, if students have taken that and are strong with that, they've taken, mo you know, they've covered most of what the material is they're going to see on the SAT, whereas the ACT, you know, they, they might benefit from the higher level classes. And as far as what's better to take. You know, we, we always recommend take both if you can. I, I mean, I know my, my own son who wasn't probably the best student, you know, and he took the SAT and, and struggled, but then he took the ACT and got a 23, which it translated to a much higher score. And I think that helped him get into some colleges. So if you can take both, I think that's definitely going to be beneficial. You know, look at, you know, check what the colleges you're going to apply to. Some might require one and not the other. So you don't want to take one and you took the wrong test. So make sure you're looking at that. And then the big thing I think is practice, you know, to, to do practice tests. You know, I was reading some articles about it before we, we had this presentation. What they really said was that if you can, and I, you know, it, it'd be hard to maybe get your student to do this, but to sit down and there are free practice tests out there to sit down and actually do a free full, you know, three or four part test, and it might take half a day, but if you have them take the ACT, take the SAT in a practice version, you could probably see where they're gonna do better. And, and not just to see how they're gonna do better, you know, which one they're gonna do better on, but I know we see when kids take the test, all, I mean, I would say 90% of the time, from the first time to the second time to the third time, they steadily go up. So if the first time they take it is the practice test, and the second time they take it is the real test, they're already going to be, you know, scoring above probably where they would. So I, I think a big benefit would be to take that practice test, do what kind of any kind of practice you can to get a feel for that. So I think another thing I would sorry, Mr. Rails, go ahead. I was going to say another thing I would recommend with the practice test because of our current situation and where we're at. And I know this sounds very weird, but I would encourage your student to practice by like creating the test environment. So part of that, unfortunately, these days is going to be having them wear a mask because if they were to take the test in May or in March, 
uh, May or June. Well, who knows about May or June, but probably March at this point, it's definitely safe to think that they're going to have to take the test wearing a mask. So I would encourage them to practice in that environment so they can be used to it. Because we all know everything feels a little bit different when we're behind those masks. So I think that's something to consider when they're doing a practice test as well. So another thing we wanted to touch on is the answer class that I had mentioned earlier. Um, so the answer class is an organization that does test prep for both the SAT and the ACT. And typically we offer it here in conjunction with our PTSO and it's usually a Saturday or two um, that the kids come into the school and they actually do the class. This year, because of the current situation, they're doing it virtually. And I don't know exactly what the dates are, but I will definitely, after we finish today, I will definitely email you guys with all of this information. I think it's like two nights or maybe a Sunday or something. I don't know. But anyway, um, it's an, a virtual opportunity for the students to log online and participate in these classes virtually. And they're like two hours long. So it's not like a crazy amount of time to be sitting in front of their computer. Um, and as an added bonus, we always want to support our PTSO. So as an added bonus, if you sign up for this, 20% of the tuition collected is donated to the PTSO. So we can also not only get our students some really good prep, but also support the PTSO in the process. Um, and if you sign up at least ahead of the course, um, you can save $20. So that's a motivator too. And I think it's at the end of February. But again, I'll look at that information. Um, you would just register online at theanswerclass.com. And when you go to that website, you just have to select what high school you want to take it at because they offer it all around the country. So you would just have to select Calvert High um, in order for our PTSO to get that benefit. So this is another really great opportunity, and it can also support the PTSO in the process. Then as far as registration for the SAT and ACT, that will be done through their websites. Um, so you're going to have to, you know, the SAT is going to be through College Board. The ACT is going to be through the College Board web or the ACT website. And for each of those, um, you'd have to create an account first. Then once you'd create the account, you'd go back in and register for the test. Um, if your student is taking an AP class right now, they probably already have a College Board account. I think that's required now with the AP classes. So, um, so that might be taken care of. Um, be conscious, you know, we say be conscious of the deadlines. Um, I, I think the kids get very used to, to, you know, here at school deadlines are sort of flexible. You know, I guess with ACT and SAT, it's, they are not flexible. And if you miss a deadline, a lot of times you can register late, but it's gonna cost you money, you know, and they'll be happy to take, you know, more money than they're already taking from you, um, you know. Plan to take the SAT and ACT more than once. Um, you know, two, when, when you're setting up your account, I don't know if, you know, if your student might already have one for the um, college board with the AC, but with the ACT, make sure that they know their login and password, you know, because when they go to register for the, for the SAT, I don't know how many times we've sat here with kids and they go to register for the SAT or, and, and they can't get in, and it's because somewhere along the way, it might have been in ninth or 10th grade, they created a college board account um, when they got their PSAT score. And it's already in there under their name. And, and college board is very, very finicky as far as letting there be, you know, a kid create two accounts because they don't want any cheating. We know that's been an issue. Um, it's been all over the news. So, so we end up, you know, having to get on the phone with the kid and, and call. And it's, it's a long process and these days we're not here with the kids so that they're going to have to do that from home and that create you know it, it creates a lot of headaches and I think kids get you know get this sense of security because they they have it on their phone so they don't really know what their login and password is you know it's like oh it's just on my phone so so make sure they know their login and password um, so they could go in and register for those tests um, you know, we always say have the test ready by or scores ready by the end of the junior year. You know, so if you're thinking of doing, you know, with that in mind, you know, the next SAT is March 13th. If you take it in March, you get your score back in a month. If you don't like your score, you have time to turn around and now retake it again in May or June. So you've had two chances by the end of your junior year. So, so you should be in pretty decent shape. And there's still time in your senior year if you need be. But you don't want to wait to, to, you know, if you wait till June of this year to take it and you don't like your score, now you're into your senior year. 
to get, you know, to take it maybe once and then college application deadlines are, are coming due. So, so keep that in mind um, as you're registering for the test. Also, when you sign up for the, the test, you can indicate colleges that you want uh, your score sent to for free. You could do four of those. Um, and I know now maybe your first test in March of your junior year, you might not know that, but later on you may. And then finally, fee waivers. Um, there are, if, you, if you're experiencing any kind of economic hardship, um, there are fee waivers available and your students should see us and we can help them out with that. Generally, sort of our, our general guideline is free or reduced lunch, but I think these days there's a lot more going on. So if that is an issue, please, please reach out to us and we can help you out with that. Something else to keep in mind too with the registration, I think for the tests is in past years, and generally it's about a month before you have to register from the test date. Um, and the ACE or the SAT is offered pretty much in line with the school year. They offer it from August through June each year. So a lot of students will say, oh, well, I'm going to take it this summer, but you really can't. The only test date that they offer in the summer really is the June test. But, um, but anyway, this year, especially because of social distancing guidelines and rules and regulations, they're not able to take as many students at each test site. So the test sites fill up really quickly. So if your student's even thinking about taking it in May or June, and I know I had emailed out like a little chart with all of the test dates and the deadlines and the late registration deadlines, but if your student's thinking about taking it in May or June, I know our kind of, and I'm this way too, I'm like, oh, I don't really have to worry about it until that test deadline, the, the registration deadline gets close. I would encourage you to sign up sooner rather than later, just because like it's really tough to get in. I know, and this was like this past fall, but I had a couple of students who drove to like Virginia. Some of them went to Pennsylvania because that was the closest test center that they could find that accepted students at that point. So that's something to keep in mind as well. That's kind of like unique to our juniors this year just because of our current situation. Um, so speaking of COVID, here's been some updates this year because the, the college application process has greatly changed because of COVID. It's definitely been impacted. Um, so for the current, our current seniors this year, a lot of the colleges chose to make the SAT or ACT optional just because like last spring students really with everything being fully shut down, students really had no access to be able to take the test. Um, so we're not really sure to be honest what that's going to mean for your students who will be applying to colleges in the fall. So what I did over the past couple weeks is I called some colleges to kind of pick their brains and ask them what advice that I should give to my students who will be applying to these schools. Um, and just to kind of go over some of the things, so Salisbury, they've always been, even before COVID, their normal admissions policy has been test optional, but this is only available to students who have a, a GPA of at least a 3.5 or above. Um, but they aren't really sure what's gonna happen. Like this year, they're test optional for everybody, but they're not sure what's gonna happen for the upcoming year. They said that they're gonna be making decisions um, like over the summer, they thought, like into the spring and summer. Um, but JJ Remo, who is our admissions counselor for our area, he noted and really strongly pushed that has, if a student has test scores, that that could potentially be used to help them get scholarship money. So he really encouraged me to tell my students if they are able to take the SAT or ACT, that they should. Even if it's not, it doesn't end up being required for admission to Salisbury, it's very helpful and may um, give them access to scholarships. So that's something to keep in mind. University of Maryland, they really had no information to tell me. They basically said, we're gonna be looking at this information in the spring and summer, and we'll let our applicants know later on. Um, and they're kind of tough. Um, so who knows what will end up happening with Maryland. Um, Towson, they confirm that they are going to be test optional for our juniors this year. So for next year, when your student applies, Towson will be test optional. So if your student's looking to apply to Towson, they won't necessarily need SAT or ACT scores. St. Mary's College of Maryland, um, they've always been test optional and the admissions rep that I talked to anticipated that that would continue um, for the foreseeable, foreseeable future. Um, another college I called was Frostburg and they haven't made any decisions about um, testing either, but they anticipated that they would kind of have a decision this spring. Um, and they also mentioned, like Salisbury mentioned, that having a test score from the SAT or ACT might help out with the student being able to get more scholarship money. Um, so feel free to, I just kind of called a couple colleges that a lot of our students apply to, but if there are any schools that your son or daughter is really interested in attending, the admissions office is a great source of information. 
And a lot of times if you just go on their website, you can get an email address for a counselor or you can just call the office. Because I think this is a very common thing that colleges are thinking about. And I would continue to monitor websites as well because I know all of these schools had mentioned to me too that they'll release any information as it comes in on their website. So if you keep an eye on a website, that will help give you the most up-to-date information as well. And then with the school day SAT, I know this past year we offered in the fall, we offered the SAT to seniors where they actually came in and took the test. And that was something that had been pushed back that you know they were gonna offer to them as juniors last spring, but then COVID hit. So, you know, we haven't heard whether or not that's going to be offered for our current juniors this spring. Um, you know, we have, we're not really sure if we're going to, and I guess we weren't back in school even when we did that in the fall. So as soon as we get any information on that, we'll put it out to you. Um, but again, best advice plan is if it's not happening and, and register on your own for, for one of the tests that, you know, that are currently scheduled outside of the school day. I think that would be the safest thing. So, And that's what I would encourage too, just in general. I know things are quite a bit, they're very crazy because of COVID um, to say the least. But my thing is, is we really don't know what's going to happen. And I'm one of those people in life, I always like to have something and not need it versus need something and not have it. So I would encourage you to work with your students to take the SAT or ACT if possible, because it sounds like a lot of colleges that it's only gonna benefit them, even if it doesn't matter for admission, it may help them out with scholarships. And God forbid, if your student decides to apply to a school that requires the SAT or ACT, they'll have those scores. So I would encourage everyone to really kind of try to have their son or daughter take the SAT or ACT just so they have those scores, just in case. Yeah, I know Ms. Ponte and I have talked a lot about how like, how do the colleges even look at it these days? Because at times are so weird. But, um, you know, school has changed a lot in the past, you know, nine or 10 months, you know, and, and some kids are flourishing and some kids who normally flourish are struggling, you know, so maybe their grades aren't a real reflection of who they are, you know, because school hasn't been the same. But I guess, you know, in, in my mind, the one thing that's still going to, you know, be a true measure of what they know is going to be that test. So, so that might be, and I'm not, I'm not a college admissions rep, but that is something, at least that's like a level bar for everybody. You know, they're, they're, everybody's taking the same test, whereas everybody's not going to the same school, you know? So, so what, what instruction looks like in one place might look like a lot different than somewhere else. So, so that about wraps up our presentation for today. Um, and I'll show you guys in a minute to the college board, how you can search for schools on there. But just to go over some things to think about for our next session. So our next session is going to be on Thursday, February 11th, and we'll be discussing the college application process and what a college application actually looks like and what you can expect as you work with your student through that process. Um, and I know most of you guys, when you sign up, you check all of them and that's awesome. But if you haven't signed up or you want to encourage one of your friends to sign up, um, there's the link. Um, and just for a listen, I just want to get your feedback because we're really thinking about um, for next year, like how we're going to do these SAT and ACT, um, or sorry, the junior breakfast in general. We're really considering having them virtual. So we created a little survey if you wouldn't mind giving us your feedback. Um, and I'll email that to you guys as well. It's just like three questions, but it'll help us, you know, think about planning and some things to consider for the future. Um, and another thing, too, we've been meeting with students. We've been starting to meet with juniors this week in English classes and talk with them about what their plans are, go over their graduation requirements for next year and all that good stuff. And I think we've all really enjoyed being able to connect with our students. Uh, but we've been sharing a lot of information with them. Um, so if your student has Miss Milton as an English teacher, we've been meeting with them this week. And then next week, we're going to be meeting with students who have Mr. Morgan for English at Calvert High. If your student attends the CTA, they take English at the CTA, we're working with those students to meet with them a little bit differently. Um, so if your student takes English at the CTA, they've received an email from their counselor with information on how to make an appointment with us. because We just want to work with them around their own schedule so they can make an appointment with us whenever it's available. We send our links and information to their school email. So check with them on that. Um, but as part of our meetings with students, we have been sharing um, 
ways we can keep in contact with students. Um, we do remind text messages as well. So anytime anything important happens that students need to know, we send that out and this will continue into next year. So that's the information on the, the slide there. Um, if you wanted to sign up for that too, because parents are more than welcome to sign up to receive text messages as well. I'm gonna stop sharing this and I wanna pull up the College Board website so I can show you guys what I mean when I say search for colleges. While you're doing that, Ms. Ponte, I put the links in the chat for the signing up for any future junior breakfast and the feedback form. So um, Ms. Ponte said she'll email that, but if you want to, you can click on those right in the chat as well. Thanks, Ms. Sinclair. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen here. So I am just on the College Board website. I just went to collegeboard.org, the same website where your student's gonna register for the SAT. Um, but to search for colleges and what they typically require, you can just type a college name in the search box. So I'm gonna search for my alma mater, University of Scranton. So if you search for the school, and it'll come up the same for any um, college. But if you click on here, this is really helpful too. Ms. Aris and Ms. Sinclair talked about this in our last session too, in looking for colleges. This is really helpful to get a profile about a school. Um, but I think the most, the great information, the most uh, valuable information is on this applying page. So if you click on here, and it'll tell you information about GPA, AP scores as well. But the SAT and ACT scores is where you would look for information about a typical score. Um, so you can see here, it gives you a typical range. It'll give you a breakdown for the reading section, a breakdown for the math section, and then just an overall total. So you can get a good idea of what the typically accepted score would be. And, oh, the ACT part is here. They do have it for my school, but sometimes you'll see that they won't have this just because it's an opposing product. The ACT and SAT are two different companies who are looking to make money, you know, so keep that in mind. But it'll give you the score, the same thing here, like a generally accepted score. Um, and one thing to keep in mind, I always tell my students, this is just a range. This does not mean if your score, like if you were looking to apply to Scranton and you had an SAT score of 1350, it doesn't mean that you're definitely going to get in. And on the same note, it doesn't mean that if you have a score of 1100 that you're definitely not going to get in. The one important thing to think about is that the SAT is one piece of a college application. The college is also gonna be looking at their transcript and GPA. They're gonna be looking at the essay they write on the application. They're gonna be looking at recommendation letters. So this is just a piece of that overall process. I know a lot of people get hung up on the SAT or ACT and getting the best score they can, but just keep in mind that it's one piece of the application. I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing that, but um, I wanna open it up this morning. If anyone has any questions, feel free to unmute their mic and ask them, or if you guys would rather, if it's more comfortable, you can just drop your questions in the chat. I'd just like to make one more comment. I know as I'm dealing with seniors, they don't remember their password. I would really suggest, like I put it on our refrigerator because it's not just the test, you need a password. If you're gonna get um, a fee waiver for your applications, you're gonna need a password. Every time you apply to a college, you have to log on to your college board and send your score to those colleges, which does have a little cost. Um, so all of those times, you're gonna need your password. So I used to pin it up for my kids and, and then whenever they ask, I'm like, it's on the refrigerator. Honestly, um, going along with that, Ms. Harris, I would put up what that email you use. A lot of times you can reset your password as long as you know your email. And we have, I had kids last year um, that didn't remember or tried to make a new account. And then we had a problem because they had two different accounts to their college board. And because of how strict they are with the testing, they um, had to call um, on that last day when they're trying to register and combine the accounts. And I'm sure you realize that everybody's calling on that last day with a problem trying to register. So make sure you try to keep track of that email address as well um, and using the same one for everything. Um, and it should be the students because they need to get, I'm sure they're already getting used to um, using their email a lot more. So um, 
a lot of the virtual learning, but it's important for them to use their email address and check it um, and get used to that, especially once they apply to their colleges as well. They're going to get information through that. Could be for financial aid purposes, scholarships, and even from the school letting them know if they need any more pieces of their application. One other thing I wanted to mention is I know we talked a lot about um, different opportunities to practice for the SAT. One thing I know sometimes it's easier to do a one shot um, two hour session, but there are other things like test questions of the day that you can have. I'm pretty sure and I'll put the link in the chat. It's like through Varsity Tutors, you can actually download a free um, app um, or look at it on your computer and it will give you a question of the day in certain areas. So depends on how the student might work best. If they're overwhelmed by the idea of sitting down, you could also, and even you can, maybe at the dinner table every night, pull up the question and ask it to everybody there. Just finding simpler ways to incorporate it as smaller doses each day. It's another option. I'll also too, after we're done today, I'll email you guys all with that, um, the question of the day information too, because I know apps are huge for our kids and that feels like nothing, like scroll through Instagram, do a little question of the day, like that's a good motivator for our students as well. Yeah, I would say too with, you know, talking about the passwords and sort of sometimes the stumbling, don't wait till the last day to sign up. You know, I don't know how many kids come in and, you know, they wait till that last night and then I would almost plan on something going wrong the first time they try to sign up. It just seems like there's always some little stumbling block. So I, I would plan, you know, plan a week out or so. So there's plenty of time to, you know, sort of muddle through. Especially now because those seats are filling up. I had a student call me two days before the deadline earlier this year and said, there's no seats in the, available for me. And I said, I think that's because there's not as many seats available as there usually is. So I would plan on that for this year right now anyway, because their testing seats are limited at each site. Does anyone have any other questions this morning? There is a question, uh, special accommodations of SAT wants to, yes, th there are five, there are accommodations you can get through College Board. And usually um, the way we've been doing it, because I know the counselors, we usually sit in the meetings, is, you know, during the course of the meeting, if you, um, is, is they go through and as part of the meeting itself, um, Ms. Stover, who runs the meeting, will have you sign off if you want on the accommodations form and submit it to college board so you can you can get it sent in if you want. Not and I'm guessing your accommodations are accepted are accepted, but there's usually on your plan if you have one a little checkbox and it'll say state testing. So if you look over the plan, um, if you have one now, um, and if you hadn't signed one of those documents, you can look and see what's checked in the state testing and request that if you don't think you have it. Um, but once it is on file, I believe that is good for their whole time in school. You don't have to keep filling it out. So if you filled it out once and turned it in, they should be eligible. Right, I guess one thing to keep in mind though, like, and I know I think the big thing that a lot of people, you know, wanna get when they when they apply for that accommodation is extended time. That if, if you're in an extended time group, say your, your student has double time. So a test that might normally take four hours is now they're going to be in there for eight hours, whether they want to be or not, because they have to, you know, they keep those kids with the whole group that's in there for the double time. So, so that's just something to keep in mind. I, and I just say that because I know I've had some kids get the, the extended time and then get very frustrated that they've had to sit in there for a long time. So, I mean, you know your student, so that's just something to be thinking about. Another question we had in the chat was if the ACT offers the, the super score option or the best combined score. And I think Mr. Verlich talked on, the, spoke about this, but what we mean when we say the super score for the SAT is that a college will pull out the best individual score for reading, 
and the best individual score for math, even if they're not on the same test date. So let's say your student takes the test twice, once in May, once in June. In May, they do really well on math, but not as well on reading. And in June, they do really well on reading, but not as much on math. Some colleges will pull out the best scores for each of the sections and combine them, even though they're not on the same test date. Now, not every college does that. They all have their own policies for the SAT, but I would say it's relatively common. Like I'm seeing a lot of colleges really wanting to work and help out students. The ACT, I've not really seen that. I don't know if any other counselors have, but I've not, not really heard very much about a super score option like that for the ACT. They seem to just take that one score and go from there. So I've not really seen the super score for the ACT. I would encourage people to reach out to the colleges and ask that question to them too. Um, you know, they, they might be able to answer that for, for their specific college. And I would wonder how they might be willing to be a little more flexible now with COVID um, to look at that. I know someone, one of the questions here too was, uh, will you be having meetings with students to help them narrow down the colleges they could go, go to for the career they have chosen? And I guess the meeting we're having right now is not going to be that specific. It's more of a general meeting um to touch on what they need for next year and graduation requirements and if they do want to you know spend a little bit more time with us you know they they should make an individual appointment so they can meet with us and we can talk about that um you know i would also point point you guys to um michelle kidwell who comes here on fridays and meets with juniors and seniors she's with a group called the chesapeake college plan and you know, she, she'll sit down with the kids, help them narrow down their college search. Um, she's a great financial resource. I mean, I know when my kids went to college, and I know Miss Harris, will, can, you know, all of us that have had kids come through here and go to college have leaned on her organization to help figure out how to pay for college. So, but she's a great resource to really, you know, where she'll sit down and she'll sit down with you guys too as parents. Um, when they're seniors, she'll sit down and actually help you work through the FAFSA if you need help with that. And if all goes well, she should be coming in for our next junior breakfast to do a presentation as long as she doesn't have any other work conflicts. So hopefully we'll be hearing from her in our next junior breakfast um, session. She's fantastic. We really can't say enough good things about her. Then the info to sign up for the SAT and the ECT, Ms. Sinclair put those links. It's all done online. Um, you can do it by paper, but to be honest, online is the best option. Um, so Ms. Sinclair put the two websites in there, collegeboard.org for SAT, ACT.org for the ACT. And to set up an appointment with Ms. Kidwell, if you guys, um, I can email you guys her information. She has an email address um, or she uses an app called Calendly um, where you can see like the op options of times that she has available. So I can definitely email you guys her information as well. And I, th I think her information is also on the Calvert High counseling webpage, isn't it? Under resources. So links to all of her, her information would be there also. And Ms. Singletary had some advice too. She said that Service Academy super score the ACT. I did not know that. So that's some good information to have too. But I think the biggest thing when it comes to super scoring, like Mr. Verlich said, is really to double check with colleges because everybody has their own policy. So they'll be able to give you the most current information and the most specific information to what they're specifically looking at. So does anyone else have any questions this morning? Ms. Ponte, I do have a question. Um, can you hear me? Um, <laughs> so I missed part of this meeting because I was um, driving into work, but um, this was recorded. So where would I find it? I know sometimes I record my own, but I know how to get my own. I don't know how to get this one. <laughs> Absolutely. What I'll do is I'll email out to you guys and we'll also post it on our Schoology page. So when you get the update emails, it'll be posted on there as well. So you will definitely get emails with this information. Just, I guess, later on today, if I could be really fast and get it all uploaded and ready to go, but it'll come out very soon. Okay, thank you so much. Absolutely.
Well, I guess that about wraps up everything for today. So we just want to thank you guys for starting your day with us and also for bearing through us with this whole technology stuff. Because as you can tell, we're still learning. We're still, you know, adjusting to things. Um, but hopefully we'll be able to connect with you guys and see you again in February. Um, but thanks again for coming today, guys. We really appreciate it. And if you have any questions at any point in time, feel free to reach out to any of us. You can email us. You can call us anytime. We're always here. Thank you. Thank you so much, everybody, for coming. Yes, thank you all for coming. Hope to see you in February. Have a great day, guys.